Another Section 230 panel you guys are in for a treat. This one is um, how lawmakers will seek to reform it or not. We'll find out. Um, but I'm Rebecca Kern. I'm a tech policy reporter at Politico. I, I have a bit of a head cold, so I apologize for my voice. I'm going to have everyone go down the line and introduce themselves briefly, and then we'll get into it. Sorry. Yes. Uh, hi, Jewel Thayer, president of the Digital Progress Institute. Hi, I'm Yael Eisenstadt. I'm a vice president at the Anti-Defamation League, where I head the Center for Technology and Society. Matt Perrault, I'm the director of the Center on Technology Policy at UNC Chapel Hill. Hello, I'm Billy Easley. I'm the head of U.S. Public Policy at Reddit. Okay, great. Um, so, as we all know, um, Section 230 debate has largely fallen along partisan lines in the debate in Congress. But today we're going to try to um, break past these party line differences and discuss potential solutions for Congress to tackle at a bigger level. And I just wanted to go down the line and let everyone share kind of their biggest goals on 230 reform, or if you take the opposite stance that you don't want reform in Congress this this session. Can go, whoever wants to go first. Go ahead. We'll go down. Yeah. Okay, we'll go down the line. Well. I think it's better just to roadmap the, the issue to get a better framework for the discussion today. And I think the best way to do that is one, outline what are the issues related to Section 230. Uh, also kind of describe that there are, that these concerns with Section 230 are actually more bipartisan than most folks would like to admit. It's not necessarily the case that uh, whether you absolutely think it should be revoked or, uh, or you think uh, Section 230 is the best thing since fried rice, those aren't necessarily the dichotomies that we are that we deal with. So, kind of go a little bit into like the bipartisanship that exists on both sides. Also, show how actually some incremental reforms have worked and actually have gotten through Congress. So, it's it, to say that uh, something cannot be done is uh, not factually accurate by uh, just by virtue of the, the history of, of how the legislators have dealt with these issues. And just final points. Uh, so, I guess uh, the issues are really twofold as I see it. Uh, one is the, the question in C1, which you heard a lot about uh, in the first panel, which is the judge-made immunity under C1, which kind of opened the floodgates for uh, these tech platforms to be immune from virtually every type of civil action, which also in some uh, parts of the country includes contract claims. Uh, the second is uh, the censorship that you see in C2. So that, that's one thing I, where I can see the legislators trying to grapple with and trying to understand uh, how best to reform it. The second... Uh, Thing that we should realize is that both sides see a problem here. And so we, we've we already seen an example of that last Congress. We saw the introduction of the Earn It Act, where you have Grassley and, uh, Senators Grassley and Graham uh, pairing up with Senators Feinstein and Durbin to understand the implications that uh, Section 230 immunity may have, or so-called immunity may have, towards you know the prevention of sex trafficking and, and what have you. Uh, the, la uh, the, the last of uh, the points that I like to uh, that I'd really like to bring home here is that incremental, incremental approaches have worked on the legislative side. So we saw that in SESTA FOSTA, uh, where there was actually a lot. Uh, although maybe maybe some would disagree that it went far enough or not, uh, or uh, didn't, or had would have blown up the internet. I think one, two things are actually true. There were some good things that happened out of the SESTA-FOSTA conversations, uh, particularly as it relates to limiting the liability for actual harm victims of sex trafficking. I think uh, the take down the back page is one part of it. Also the Doe v. Twitter case is another example of how legislators can help fix some of the questions that we have. Uh, and also I make a clear point of this, the internet didn't break just because SESTA-FOSTA existed. So. Uh, the la last point is really, look, uh, if I would like to, see, if, if I like to see anything, I would like to see a targeted and incremental approach to any sort of, uh, any sort of reforms. I think that's usually, that's how you have to get it done. You can't just, you, I, I think someone said this earlier in the early panel, pick a goal. And I think that frankly, that's, that's ultimately how it's going to work out where, uh, both uh, congressional, both, both sides of the aisle see issues of uh, concentrated power over, over our information as an issue. I think that's fairly bipartisan. So I guess in my, in, in my view, it's strong, uh, but you need strong bipartisan support and incremental change will most likely be the winner at the end of the day. All right, it's going down the line. Um, thank you for framing it. Now, that was a great framing. I don't have to go into some of the framing points I want to do because I, I agree with much of what was just said. 
Um, for me, part of the conversation about Section 230, it's intentionally being pitted into binaries, and I just want to unpack a few of the binaries. That's my framing um, for the conversation. I, I really would like us to get to the point where this conversation can go beyond whether or not a platform should be responsible for third-party contact and really into what is platform behavior and how is that different from actual liability for third-party content. And so some of these binaries of it's either going to, you're going to kill the internet or you're going to kill all the smaller companies or if you do anything to touch 230, every single company is just going to be bogged down in never-ending lawsuits. I think some of that is maybe true if we're talking about killing Section 230. But I think most people in this room understand that, I, I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of others, but I, for one, am certainly not speaking about killing Section 230 or keeping it as is. I want to talk about how do we update the law today to fit the reality of what the internet is right now. And some of that is about figuring out what is a company's behavior, especially and I'll get into this later in this panel with some examples. I mean, if a company's behavior is actually enabling violation of civil rights laws, how is that not something we should consider? And that is very different from the defamation questions or the questions of third party speech. So what I would like to see Congress actually ask, and again, also sorry, the Democrats versus Republicans, Democrats want to take more content down, Republicans want to take more content up, that's actually really just focusing on content moderation, right? And I would like to focus the conversation on behavior and conduct of the actual companies versus content moderation. What I would like to see Congress consider and really talk about is where should Section 230 protection stop? Where are the lines? And I don't just mean the word algorithms because that's like become this whole thing of, but algorithms run the internet. But what are the lines? Are the lines in targeted advertising, especially if a company's targeting tools can actually help you engage in civil rights violations? Is the line where a company auto-generates pages for terrorist content and actually creates those pages themselves? Is the line when a company's tools actually connect a perpetrator of a crime with a victim? I, I'm not saying we have all the answers to that, but that's the conversation I want to see have instead of a conversation about content moderation. Um, and I'll just say two last points. I'm sure any of us here could talk for a full hour about this first question. We hear so much, it's just too hard. It's too hard to define what all that looks like. Or it's too hard to address these issues. Companies will get buried in lawsuits. We heard the Supreme Court start to quibble over what's an algorithm and what's a this. A lot of that conversation is actually meant to help us think it's too hard and therefore we should remain with the status quo. And I think there's some very specific examples I hope to go into on this panel that will show where Congress could play a role in updating these rules. Um, I'm Matt Peralt. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you so much to Tim and others for organizing this wonderful event. Um, I think before I get into some specific uh, ways to think about 230 reform, um, maybe I could just start with an observation. And the observation is that in the conversations like this one, which I consider to be sort of expert conversations with people who know the internet, though the substance that is proposed as potential options for reforming Section 230 typically look very different than the, sub than the substance that has actually been proposed in Congress. So if you look at the reform options that have been proposed, I think there's a dichotomy between what you'll probably hear today or you'll, you'll hear at lunchtime and your networking lunch um, from people who work in the field and then what we're seeing on the Hill. In our, um, in our preparation uh, conversation for this panel, I made, I made that statement and I thought of it sort of, I guess, in the typical sense of sort of a way to be critical of the knowledge that exists on Capitol Hill and in the administration around um, formulating solutions to this issue. As I sort of thought about it more, I guess I mean it more actually as a critique of us in this community, in the expert community, for failing to come up with solutions that are responsive, not just to the substance of the issue. So I think all of us have, have thoughts about how to be responsive to the substance of the issues. That's the driving force, I think, for what our recommendations might be, but also responsive to the politics. And so we're looking, I think, for solutions that will create a better internet that are both responsive to the substance of the issue and then also responsive to political concerns that people have. I think the failure to reform this area is probably due in part, I think, to 
inadequate solutions that are responsive to both of those considerations. So now I will give you a list of five things that I came up with that I think are inadequate, it seems like, to the political concerns because they've gotten zero traction. Um, so the first is reforming federal criminal law. So as Barron said, I think in his comments, um, federal criminal law is an exemption to Section 230, so you can initiate a case against a provider um, under federal criminal law. Uh, uh, a platform cannot use federal criminal law as a defense in that case. That means for many of the concerns, at least some of the concerns that, we're, that we have about platform, about speech on platforms, uh, 230 is not a defense. So if we had a law on voter suppression, for instance, we don't actually have a federal criminal law on voter suppression. If we had a federal criminal law on voter suppression, Section 230 would not be a defense. The, um, the law governing um, the use of communications tools to riot was passed in the late 1960s, has not been updated since then. That is a federal criminal law. Though if you uh, file a case using that federal criminal law as the basis for it, Section 230 is not a defense. So Congress has options available to it to look at things that we think are problematic and pass federal criminal law in this area. 230 wouldn't be a defense, and that would shift uh, it, uh, intermediary liability for, um, for platforms and also enable us to go after perpetrators more effectively. Second option is to focus on the differentiation between an interactive computer service and an information content provider. An information content provider does not have 230 um, protections. Um, the language in the statute is develop content in whole or in part. So what does develop content in part mean? There's been very limited jurisprudence, I think, on this question. I think this is a little bit of what the court was going back and forth on last, uh, last week. And I think more robust development of that line would be very helpful. Um, there are others, I think, in this audience who understand a little bit more about the types of policy tools that would be available for setting that line, various different things like advisory opinions or policy statements by the FTC, for instance, I think are ways to explore what the criteria might look like for delineating between those two um, components. Um, a third is looking at product tools that would actually identify perpetrators. So platforms can actually build tools to enable law enforcement officials to go after um, perpetrators of illegal content more easily. That would mean reporting mechanisms to state attorneys general, for instance, or reporting mechanisms to nonprofits who might help um, individuals um, to redress harms in different ways. That doesn't, um, 230 is not implicated in that. That is platforms facilitating individual liability more effectively. Um, a, a, a fourth, which has been talked about in lots of contexts, is uh, researcher data access so that we actually understand more about harms that exist on platforms. And then a fifth is, um, I think, the, an idea that I supported in a paper I wrote on it was um, some version of the PACT Act. There are like, I think a lot of people in the first panel were sort of talking about that as a viable model, perhaps with tweaks at the edges. I included this recommendation in the paper, and I think it was an example actually of, um, of a bias that I had because of my prior employer. So I was on the policy team at Facebook um, for several years. And the stuff in the PACT Act seems kind of unobjectionable, I think, from the perspective of a large company like Facebook, regular transparency reports, someone on staff to handle, to process um, complaints about illegal activity. For a large platform, that's very routine. You have huge legal teams, huge policy teams, huge, huge communications teams that can handle that type of volume and process it. In the wake of this paper, I got a lot of feedback from companies like Reddit, for instance, so I'm excited to hear what Billy will say about this, um, that, that that is really biased towards large platforms, that smaller platforms would struggle with the kinds of requirements that are in the PACT Act um, because they increase compliance costs, and for smaller platforms, increased compliance costs makes it more difficult for them to compete. Um, so, Billy, over to oh, you. Great, <laughs> wonderful. Um, what a segue. Uh, so what, what I really wish Congress would do since 230 has become this political football, is let's put the football down for a second. Let's take a few steps back. Let's just ask a few questions. What are the specific problems we're trying to solve as a policymaking body? What are the harms, the specific harms we're trying to mitigate? And what populations are we trying to protect? And once we have nailed down those framing devices, let's try to figure out what's the best way to solve that. What's the best way to directly respond to those issues? And spoiler alert, like in the opinion of the Reddit policy team and ourselves as a company as a whole, we think there are a slew of policy options that Congress has that more effectively answers some of the questions that have been brought up in this panel so far, right? When it comes to issues like we've heard, Joel mentioned uh, the concerns about conservative censorship. We've also heard about transparency, access to research data, there are other ways that we can sort of deal with these issues beyond using the blunt instrument of 230. 
And the other thing that I just want to know, because I don't want to hold us up, I, we have, there's so much more for us to talk about here, um, is whenever we limit laws that make it easier for people to engage in speech, make it easier for users to create communities or find communities that serve them content or connect them with other people um, that make them feel welcome and inclusive. When that happens, there's a blast radius. There's going to be less speech in other areas. We saw this with SESTA FOSA. We've seen this in other sort of proposals as well. And I just really wish that Congress would, would keep that in mind, what the impact will be on the internet generally and on users specifically. And that's the sort of thing that we tried to highlight when we submitted our brief to the Supreme Court with regarding Gonzalez versus Google by empowering our users to, to speak about how their specific communities would be impacted if Section 230 was limited. Um, but with that, Rebecca, go, go ahead. I know you have some fine questions for us. <laughs> well, I mean, you guys are doing a great job. Um, I, I guess I wanted to talk about SESTA FOSTA because it is the one time Congress has taken the scalpel um, and cut back some of 230 protections with the intent of, you know, the good intent, no, no, you know, noble intent of stopping sex trafficking. It has some unintended consequences of putting sex workers potentially um, in dangerous situations. So I wanted to use that as a jumping off point. What kind of lessons can we learn in this community of experts um, so that, you know, to inform Congress to not make those same mistakes? Because as you were saying, every, every, you know, proposal has its unintended consequences. So is there a way to educate Congress or is there a spe spe specific issue that you think could gain bipartisan traction that um, would would maybe avoid these negative consequences that you're imagining? So two things. First, um, I'm going to break that down. The, the lessons with sesta -FASA that I think Congress yeah. can learn um, and other issues that Congress could sort of focus on that are related to CDA 230. Um, when it comes to SESTA FOSTA, you know, what does it mean to engage in a venture related to child sexual exploitation? Courts seem to have a hard time figuring that out. Like, this law has been too vague to be enforced appropriately in a lot of ways. And, I mean, uh, no offense to Joel, love you guy, but the GAO report demonstrated some of the failures of SESTA FOSTA to be used effectively in the way that lawmakers intended. Um, I, I think the key thing is, if you're going to write a law like this, let's make sure that everyone on down, whether it's policymakers, judges, prosecutors, um, and of course, companies themselves understand exactly what the impact will be and how to stay out of uh, potential um, actions that could get them into liability. Um, I, with Reddit specifically, there were sex worker communities where people were just simply talking about how they had been impacted through sex work, not engaging or asking for, um, uh, uh, for favor, sexual favors or whatever. Um, and we had to shut those communities down because there was no way for us to know particularly what the line was. And so I think it's really important um, if Congress decides to engage in this sort of stuff that there is a clear fault line between liability and protected speech. Can I respond to yeah, that? Yeah, sure. So, and delayed, the love is shared. Uh, <laughs> but I think that uh, to limit this to a, con I mean, first, I, will, I, f I hope we get beyond SESTA FOSTA today. Yeah. Uh, but I think to limit this to, hey, Congress messes up when they write laws, I mean, and judges like judges will interpret because that's what they do, is what got us in this issue in the first place. I mean, the whether you're talking about the judge-made immunity or the, the vagaries that exist in Section 230 are always going to be a problem. So I think to say, to, to simply, and, I, and, I'm, and I hope I'm not asserting uh, something that I think, I hope I'm not misrepresenting what you're that's saying, fine. but I, I think this sort of is hearkening back to a more libertarian view, which is like, let's not touch it because bad things can happen. I think that's absurd. I think that, I think even from a political uh, standpoint, that's, that's just not, that's just not the reality. I mean, if you really want to do this, I do believe that you can take targeted approaches. You can do something incrementally. I think that's something that is bipartisan is this relationship between the concentration, the uh, significant concentration of information with a select few 
corporations that kind of control how we think through the discourse. If you want to just, if, you, if you're really worried about small businesses, and Billy, I'm speaking to you here, uh, then maybe there is an opportunity for Congress to outline exactly what type of company you're talking about. And maybe, uh, and I agree with you, maybe there, there should be some clarifications in sesta fosta but to say that it was categorically bad is not true. I mean, I, I do think that there was a, a really good uh, outcome when Twitter was held accountable for not taking down uh, you know, a, basically what was revenge porn on, ch on children. I think that was a good result that, that ultimately allowed the ca case to move forward and didn't let Section 230 to be an immunity. Again, I think I agree with you, Billy, that we should articulate the goal. However, I don't think that we simply poo-poo uh, the entire idea because there was one, there's a few courts that may have some bad interpretations. Yeah, can I pick up on that, actually? Um... I too do not want this whole conversation to be about, <laughs> about Sesta Pasta. That said, um, you like Sesta Fiesta. Yeah. <laughs> that said, listen, part of part of that we can't solve in this conversation, and part of that is just how inflexible our lawmaking and policymaking regimes are to begin with, and that's just not what this panel is about. But I mean, one of the lessons is that we probably need a more flexible way to not just consider lawmaking, but consider how to be able to update as we get more and more data about how the enforcement of the law is going. But that aside, um, I think one of the things, so, so we at ADL, as I said before, we focus a lot more on platform behavior. Yes, we obviously, our mandate is to look, especially for the center of tech and society, is to look at the proliferation of hate and extremism and harassment online. Um, but one of the other lessons is what are the things that we can look at, again, more that focuses on conduct and behavior of the company versus on whether or not they are engaging in the right kinds of content moderation. And I'm gonna give you one sort of specific example, um, which I alluded to before. So many of you in the room are probably familiar with the fact that you know Facebook, also where I used to work, so I think we both have a, and a, a bit of a different view on this, but Facebook advertising in and of itself, they continue to use Section 230 as their excuse to not ever be held accountable for any of their own targeting tools. Now, Facebook's targeting tools, they, they, let's look at the, the cases about discrimination in housing and jobs, right? So yes, you can say that the advertiser should be held responsible if they are going to purposely exclude a group based on their race, their age, their gender, from seeing housing ads or from seeing job opportunity ads, which we know is a civil rights violation. But would you also argue that Facebook, whose own targeting tools that they have designed and monetized are what is allowing that advertiser to discriminate based on age, race, gender, should that also be immune under 230? And then many people, when I engage in that conversation, they say, oh, but that, that case was settled. The case being settled does not mean that the question has been settled mm. because those cases are still ongoing right now. And Facebook continues to assert that Section 230, just because they settled, doesn't mean that they don't still say Section 230 should immunize them, <clears throat> not just from the fact that their targeting tools allow this kind of discrimination. But yes, even when the advertiser themselves is not necessarily checking the box to discriminate, Facebook's targeting tools sometimes is doing it itself. And I'm just going to point that there is a person in the back of the room who is actually prosecuting these cases. So if you don't believe me, please go speak with Peter later. These are legitimate things that Facebook continues. And I get it. Section 230 affects Reddit. It affects smaller platforms. But Reddit is not engaging in selling targeting tools to allow you to actually discriminate in violation of civil rights. And so those are the things that we want to focus on more. I agree entirely with Yale's first point about the inflexibility of the current policy process. I think SESTA-FOSTA is an example of two failures. One is substantive. It was designed to protect the sex worker industry. The sex worker industry is now protesting for its repeal. That, I think, is, suggests that maybe the law isn't performing as its proponents, um, as its proponents hoped it would. But I actually think that's maybe is like the less important concern. I think the most important concern is the one that Yale referred to, which is that we have, for some reason, a model in our public policy system 
that we pass a law on day one and we just hope it's going to do really well, it's going to perform really well in practice for the next 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. I think Section 230 has performed unbelievably well, but it was passed in 1996. Um, that is held up as well as it has, I think, suggests that it is. it was a strong law at its creation. But the world is different, and it probably suggests that it could be tweaked at least at the edges, if not dramatically shifted, to reflect the world we currently exist in today. We don't have a policy regime, for whatever reason, that enables us to experiment with public policy, to right. incorporate learnings from how public policy tools perform in practice, and then improve a policy regime over time. There are a lot of people who are critical, for whatever reason, of the idea of experimentation in tech policy. And it doesn't quite make sense to me because we believe in experimentation in other fields, including fields that I think are more important and have more life, death, risk than tech policy. We would not have, I don't think, vaccines today at all. We wouldn't have a COVID vaccine, for instance, if we did not permit medical trials, because medical trials enable us to test whether medicine works, if it, uh, affect a range of different potential harms, and then tweak the medicine in light of what we've learned in the course of a trial. The absence of that kind of mentality in tech policy, I think, does a few different things. One, it means that we have to try really hard on day one to get it right, because if we don't get it right, it's going to be on the books for 40, 50, 60 years. I think it's going to be incredibly hard to repeal SESTA-FOSTA because of the politics of it, even though I think there are a lot of people who believe that it is a bad law. Um, and, it, it, and it also just means that we are unable, it means that there is a high political bar to passing any reform in the tech sector because we know that anything that we do is going to exist on the books for a long period of time in the future. And that means we need a certain amount of political capital that I think is an immense amount of political capital to get anything done. If we had more of an experimental model where we pass a law that might exist for 12 months or 18 months or two years, we enable researchers to gather data on how that law is performing in practice. And we have some mechanism then for incorporating that data into the policy process at the end of that trial period so we can, um, we can improve policy in the long run. I think that that would be ideal. Even in rooms like this, filled with people who are brilliant in this field, I sort of think that it's possible that most of us don't really know how this stuff's going to perform in practice. We have our hunches. It's informed by a lot of different things. We, we have our beliefs about, based on our own experience about how something's going to perform, but we don't really know. And an experimental model in tech policy would enable us to test our assumptions and then to improve policy based on what we see in reality. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned the fact that you know, Reddit has a, a different sort of model when it comes to advertising, right? We mostly target users through their interests, right? If you follow the r slash soccer subreddit or r slash cats like I do, you're probably going to get products related to that, right? So that that is a differentiation regarding platform behaviors. Um, and something I'm not I'm not going to ask you this. Maybe over drink sometime. <laughs> I I am interested in why CDA two thirty has to be the method through which we needle out the sort of insidious platform behaviors are problematic platform behaviors. Sometimes it's the, the only thing you might, we might assume that might be the only way to do it, but I, I wonder if there's some other ways that we can sort of experiment and deal with those sorts of issues that doesn't use this particular statute because of how it impacts our users. Um, and then the other thing I'll just note quickly, Matt, I, I did, I've, I've read your policy proposals. I think they're very interesting. Um, the problem is whenever I look at my bill tracking list of what's going on on the state and federal level, right? It does not reflect the sort of, uh, you know, we're going to stop and see and do a lot of experimentation based on data, right? Most, that's just not how it tends to work. There are a couple bills that I think that's the, that's the issue. It tends to work poorly, right? So we don't have a model. We have models in all other parts of life. Um, where we test and we use those tests to inform our policy regime. Other countries have those models. There are regular, regulatory sandbox and sandboxes and jurisdictions all throughout the world. Why can't we have that in tech policy? I agree entirely that we don't. And I agree entirely that proposals that many of the folks in this room have introduced and thought of as the right proposals in this field don't get political traction because I think they're not responsive to the politics. But I think the issue is that we have a framework set up where we, ha we have to have certainty on day one that a thing is gonna perform in practice as we say it's gonna perform. And that introduces just an unbelievably high standard for lawmaking that I think doesn't work in a world that's moving as quickly as the tech policy world is. Do I have to wait for drinks to answer Billy's question or can I answer it here? Because it actually takes us into the, the next topic, yeah. right? Yeah, sure. So listen, I and 
I, before I joined Adele and currently have never argued that Section 230 is the end-all, be-all one thing that will fix the internet. It is one piece of a larger puzzle. And that's another argument that some people, and I'm not saying you at all, I'm, when I say some people assume I mean my former employer, um, that some people like to use to shut down the conversation, right? At the end of the day, this is still the only industry that benefits from a protection that no other industry benefits from because we wanted technology to flourish, because now technology is too hard for us to all understand. And so no matter what, including all the other laws I would love to talk about, Section 230 still does. It has been so overly broadly interpreted. So to me, it's not actually about whether we should completely amend how it is written. It is about how has it been interpreted to this date to just be used to throw out cases before a victim has any opportunity to even get to discovery, to even start to learn, to your point about being able to learn to re reform our entire process, whether or not that platform did play a role in facilitating that harm. And that is one of the things I just, I cannot continue to understand how as a society, which one of the principles here is that a victim is supposed to be able to face the person or the entity that helped commit a crime and have their day in court. And 230 has been so broadly interpreted that that has just become a huge barrier. But I would say there are all sorts of other things. One of the reasons that we have been fighting so hard for some of the transparency laws, like AB 587 and others, is because part of the conversation we're having today is based on assumptions because we have no true insight into how these things actually work in these companies. And to this day, we continue to rely on companies to self-report, and that is what we are using to write our laws. So we don't believe in transparency for just transparency's sake. We want to see true transparency in how platforms' own tools are being used, how their policies are being enforced, there are some other ideas of transparency out there that we fundamentally disagree with. For us, it's about getting insights into where these companies' own roles are, how they're enforcing their own policies so that we can write better laws, so that we can enact more data-driven policies. So to your point, Section 230 is not the end-all, be-all only thing, but it is the law that has enabled platforms. I know when I worked at Facebook and I tried so hard to get a voter suppression rule passed within the political advertising system, which was easy. We had it all worked out how it would be done. They said no. Anyone who knows my story knows that's why I left. But they flat out said no, and I believe it's because there was no incentive for them to do the right thing because they don't have to. So while Section 230 is not the one thing that fixes the internet. I will continue to say we can't just push it aside for all these other laws that we hope to get passed because it still enables truly bad behavior by some companies. And that is something we need to address. And, and yeah, I, I just want to respond okay. to that I, yeah. uh, because I think, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think that there are tweaks that you can make to Section 230 that make perfect sense and things that are, are getting currently debated. I think uh, earlier to... Uh, uh, previous panel, I believe it was Matt Wood who was describing this question of distributor liability versus a, pl a publisher liability. That is something that should actually be articulated in some way. And I, and I see your grievance, Baron. I know I see you there. But what <laughs> my, but I mean, it is, a, it is a legitimate uh, concern to, to not only address from a legislative perspective, but also to be very clear as to what they, uh, what publisher liability actually means or what, what the words mean in the text. Because to speak uh, directly to Yale's point, I mean, this is precisely why C1 is a problem. C1 is a problem because, frankly, all, most all civil liability can basically be thrown away because, oh, well, uh, we can't discern whether this is uh, a, they're acting as a publisher at one, in, one instance or, and then at the same token, later down in their own brief, they say, actually, we're a distributor, so that this doesn't really matter. So I think that this level of, of conflicting notions are something that, yeah, maybe Congress should uh, take up and maybe dis discuss more, uh, more intuitively. Uh, other thing, on, you talk about C2. Uh, that's where you get to one of the censorship issues. Like There are legitimate uh, things that have been thrown out. And uh, I know this is the moment I say this, everyone's going to groan. But uh, I, th I think truly, if you want to look at how the, the statute has been interpreted to allow for this type of moderation, 
uh, I think you really look at the how, uh, how courts have just overly broad, have read this in such an overbroad way where they can basically just take down uh, or they can take down whatever they want, whether it's if you're a Republican, you're really concerned about the COVID vaccines. If you're a LGBT person, uh, then uh, you're really worried about all the stuff that they take down on from the perspective that they are not liable for doing any of that because they're actually, quote unquote, encouraged to do so. Well, OK, then my uh, a reasonable take is put up a public accommodation onto that. So that way no one can uh, get taken down for those particular or they don't at least get those immunities if they violate some form of public accommodation. And that could include political affiliation. That could include uh, gender identity. That can include uh uh, sex, all the traditional things that you would get from a public accommodation. It just, it makes perfect sense. And I, I, I think anyone who worries that, oh, that's too broad or that's too, like, well, look, you guys are seem to be very big fans when the court actually rules your way. Maybe, maybe take, uh, try your hand there. Cause I ultimately, I think the courts will, uh, will get that right. If they have a framework right now, they do not have that framework. So maybe it's up to Congress to give them that. Well, so this week, Congress will have a hearing. The Senate Judiciary Committee is going to have a Section 230 hearing um, in the wake of the Gonzalez v. Google case, which we had the previous panel on, discuss. Um, what we expect will be discussed will be the Earn It Act, um, potentially the Safe Tech Act. And I just wanted to see if there are some provisions of those bills or current legislation that you think could be thread a needle uh, on some of the issues we're discussing right now. I mean, Earn It has not been reintroduced. It will be, though. So, And it is Blumenthal's subcommittee. So. <laughs> so. I mean, on Earn It, my sort of view of this has always been that this is an issue on the enforcement uh, love, uh, basis uh, more than any sort of uh, 230 question. Um, one of the things that we've sort of supported as a company is, well, actually, I think it's probably the only bill that we've endorsed is the In Child Exploitation Act, which was introduced by uh, Senator Ma Marsha Blackburn, which would allow companies like ours to hold evidence related to CSAM cases uh, up from 90 days to 180 days so that we could uh, assist um, the relevant authorities with that information as if investigations go on for too long. Because there have been times where we, by law, are not able to keep that evidence for long enough to assist them. Um, but also, there's other bills out there that deal with the enforcement side of this uh, and the prosecutorial side of this. Uh, Senator Wyden's Invest in Child Safety Act, which provides $5 billion of, of funding to NCMEC, the Department of Justice, and creates an office in the White House to coordinate efforts um, agency-wide against CSAM efforts. So, um, I, for, quite frankly, I think that's more effective than what's in the Earn It Then Act. I'll turn 230 yeah. for that. I mean, we... we we actually have a, uh, we're quoted in the release for the Safe Tech Act, so I feel like I should at least uh, bring that one up. Listen, it, like with many of the laws as written, we agree with the spirit of it. The problem is when you get down to really how it will be enforced in the actual details, right? Like just one of the things in the Safe Tech Act is, can we start differentiating between what is information and what is speech, right? So... That's going to be, that gets back into the content moderation side, which I said is actually not my prime focus. So I realize that that is opening up a whole Pandora's box. But we do think that some of the act, sure, it needs to be refined and the wording needs to get more specific. Like they talk about paid advertising. My issue with paid advertising also falling under the same rules is not when it's just paid advertising. It's when it's paid advertising that gets to benefit from targeting tools that actually are part of, I hate to throw out the term surveillance capitalism, but the surveillance business model, right? It is, should that company who is not just showing you an ad, but is actually allowing that advertiser to target you based on more than just because you like cats, but because of age, race, gender, because you liked this particular thing, we're showing you this, which might be cats, but it might also be like the Facebook whistleblowers paper showed with that story about Carol's journey to QAnon. It might also be you liked this person and within two days, we're going to start showing you and pushing you into QAnon groups. Like it, it, That's not advertising. I get it. But some of the Safe Tech Act tries to address some of this. Um, there are definitely some ways that it will need to be refined, and that the problem is it's going to be how is it enforced. 
Um, but I think we're too easily trying to throw out every single idea on the Hill because to Matt's point, the bar for it has to 100,000% not have any trade-offs. Otherwise, it breaks the internet. I mean, every industry before tried some of that as well. Let's be frank. The tobacco industry, the automobile industry, the oil and gas industry, the food industry the, uh, also the industry. did not want to be regulated and claim that it would completely destroy them. And guess what? They all still exist. So I, I don't think there's that perfect bill out there. That is the bill that I'm thinking is going to fix the internet, whatever that means. But if we could get past, the, the biggest problem is it becomes a partisan football and then we can't get past any of the partisan debate about it. And so I'm not really hopeful that Congress is going to go anywhere. But there are some really important principles being debated right now on the Hill that I hope have a chance to be debated. Well, one thing that does have bipartisan support is the recognition that there are these market concentrations or, and those market concentrations are in relation to uh, the information and the content distribution. So I, I don't necessarily share the view that it's uh, impossible to get there. And I'm not saying, you know, you're saying that. I'm mo mostly just, I think there's a little bit more optimism than there is skepticism because I think that there are, there are going to be those trade-offs. And I think to Billy's point, there are unintended consequences that do happen to small businesses that we do want to protect and we do want to ensure that they don't get affected by. So I think as, and I fully agree with Billy on this, like articulate your goal, like figure out what your goal is and then try to execute from there. And as opposed to take a very, uh, ephemeral problem and try to, uh, as uh, as some of the panel said, create a law that may last 20, 20, 30 years. So I think step one, articulate the goal. Step two, uh, I mean, execute it in a way that's consistent with, you know, uh, the basically the harm you're trying to quell. So I, I, but again, I do think that there are elements of bipartisanship here. You certainly saw that last Congress. Uh, whether it's Earn It Act, whether it's OAMA, whether it's any anything else, you are seeing a element of we are skeptical of what these companies are doing. We are worried that they're doing things that we ought, that they ought not be doing. And so I think you might see more in the line of what Yale was talking about earlier, which is transparency, because these some of these uh, larger companies have operated in almost complete opacity. So it's maybe it's time to maybe that's the starting point. The starting point is start with a transparency bill and then move forward with other types of actions to be more informed. But I mean, who asked me? Matt, did you, no, did you want to, um, uh, to quote one of my favorite reality shows, um, <laughs> sometimes you, you got to be there for the right reasons is what they say on The Bachelor. <laughs> and I worry that most of the time when lawmakers work on these 230 bills, they're not doing it for the right reasons. It's not reflective of actual issues online. Now, sometimes sometimes it is. I want to be very clear with that. I think there are some good faith lawmakers who want to deal with issues. And I'm going to prove that, that I'm not just casting aspersions. Um, I think transparency is actually a really good starting point for lawmakers. The PACT Act, or do you have anything in mind? Um, if I had to, I guess, like caveat and not this is not, not an endorsement, is an endorsement by the company um are you sure uh <laughs> doubly sure <laughs> i'll get a phone call in 30 seconds um uh the platform accountability and transparency act yeah by i believe senator coons yeah. right yeah i think there are actually some really good pieces of that bill there are some issues that i have with it but i think the starting point where they're going with it uh in terms of um Researchers need access to data to be able so we so lawmakers can target effectively the issues that they're concerned about and identify potential harms. I think that I think that's a, a perfectly fine premise uh, for policymakers to to start on. Yeah, I mean, and to switch from Congress to the states, we've seen states taking a different approach um, with very partisan bills or now laws in Texas and Florida that are before the Supreme Court that would basically force force carriage of speech um, for these platforms. And then New York passing a law, um, basically going after hate speech and with that as the ultimate goal, but there's been First Amendment claims that this is violative of that as well. So. Um, I, I know Joel went in our prep call where you were, we were talking about how these are both kind of colliding laws <laughs> that as platforms that are global, 
we'll we'll basically basically not be able to follow both and and operate um, at least nat- nationwide. So, could you talk about some of the pitfalls these are creating and um, in the state level? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of well, I mean, I, anyone who's been around tech policy knows about the patchwork effect around privacy, and so and the complications that makes in terms of def- deciding what regulation you should. Uh, potentially, you know, follow and what what actually uh, creates the liability and who actually what statute are we are we operating under? And then I think there's a, the big issue really is you're seeing that these these states are trying to find workarounds around Section 230, which in some cases is problematic. But there are some things I actually do support. I mean, I'm clearly a fan of the Fifth Circuit. That's not a D- DPI perspective, uh, 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 but that's that's my personal. I think this Fifth Circuit actually had it right. And like and so. Uh, but again, I think that what it really speaks to is uh, this question of, okay, who do we want to, uh, how do we want to govern these particular issues? And I think a federal strategy probably makes the most sense. Uh, and if we, as long as we don't have that, and we have that essentially a vacuum, you're going to have states trying to fill in that vacuum in very strange ways. And in, in a lot of ways, very contorted ways from any practitioner who's trying to figure out you know, how to advise a client on when you're violating uh, a law in Texas versus when you're violating a law in Florida or New York. So I think this is, uh, it's probably a strong, uh, going back to the political incentives for Congress to work, that is a huge political incentives, incentive. Uh, you match that with what's happening in the Supreme Court, with what's happening in the states, and I think you're going to actually find a lot of inroads. I think uh, Ron Emanuel once said, don't waste a good crisis. And I, so I think that this is what crisis that, you know, potentially could lead to a lot of, uh, bipartisan inroads for Section 230 to clarify some of these issues. Yeah, I mean, picking up on the state strategy, which we obviously have a state strategy as well, which I mentioned earlier. Um, I mean, part of the, obviously the internet has no boundaries and borders, sorry. And so obviously a patchwork of state laws is going to be extra complicated for these companies. Um, One could argue, I'm not saying this is our strategy, but one could argue that that's sort of one of the upsides of a crazy patchwork of state strategies is to get the companies to actually come to the table and figure out what Congress could and should do. Um, One other thing, I'm sorry, I'm going to just, I wanted to add one point before this ends, and that is that one of the things that I forgot to mention earlier is right now, part of the problem with 230 is it's been so broadly interpreted that anybody who uses technology in any way whatsoever is held to the same set of rules. I mean, to Rebecca's point earlier, is Wikipedia the same as Facebook? And should they absolutely 100% be regulated the exact same way? Or are we at a point in 2023 that we were not at in 1996, where different companies actually engage And I mean, I'll give a Reddit example. I read Reddit amicus brief for Gonzalez, and I saw the Reddit concern that if you start to take into consideration recommendation engines, then does that mean the Reddit user who uses the upvote or the downvote is going to be held liable? I mean, I can't. Yes, I understand there are people with terrible ideas out there of killing 230 altogether. But to me, trying to equate Reddit's upvote from a user with a Facebook targeting tool that actually allows you to discriminate against people, it it, it shouldn't even be in the same conversation. And so part of the 230 thing that is not talked about enough is what are just pipes through which information flows and what are companies with profound amounts of power to actually cause real harm and how do we start differentiating from between some of that as well? Do you want to respond to that one? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to know. Um, I mean, that precisely that sort of the fact that there are different algorithms and tools that are just being put in the same bucket is exactly why we submitted our brief in Gonzalez versus Google, because some of the advocates on the other side seem to imply strongly that they believe that those tools should all be viewed in the same lens, which doesn't make a lot of sense in regards to platform behavior and how users interact with those. One thing I want to note just about um, the sort of state patchwork thing, um, obviously this is terrible for companies, right? You all know that. It's also really bad for users in a lot of ways. We've had users um, who have been impacted um, through uh, the Texas social media law. Um, I'm so glad I can talk about this now because for a while we couldn't. Uh, There was a user on r slash Star Trek 
who um, was banned because he insulted uh, Wesley Crusher. I'm not a Star Trek fan, so I don't know this stuff. Um, so that was a no-no. The mod banned him. Uh, and then the user used the Texas social media law to sue the moderator. Um, and we were able to sort of, you know, assist with that case in some ways, right? But like that was one of the highlights to us of, oh, this is really bad. When we have, we already, in, it's not an abstract concept that when we have these sorts of laws that essentially negate C2, right, or ban any ability for moderators to create a safer space, right, or moderate a space effectively, then what happens is moderators can be sued. Uh, for frivolous, stupid decisions. And that means you're going to have less community engagement, less moderators um, um, willing to put themselves out there. And so that's what I'm really about, worried about from uh, a state perspective. Um, and also, just to, to be honest, like, Matt, I, I, I appreciate the experimentation point, but when you experiment, you break some eggs. And there are some negative connotations that happen with that. And I, 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 I do wish that some policymakers were, were willing to be upfront about that, um, I, I know you you would be, but um, that, that's the point. You you can't have public policy that doesn't break eggs. So you can pretend that it's cost free. I think that's a lot of our policy conversation. We pretend that it's cost free. You cannot have cost free reform. So the question is about right. coming to terms, reconciling yourself to what those costs are, and then being prepared as a society to bear them. We learn that through experimentation. We don't learn it through jumping off the bridge and hoping for the best. Great. I mean, we've hit our hour, so oh. <laughs> I think we've touched everything we needed to. And thank you guys for such a, a great panel. I appreciate it. Okay.